Welcome to ESN Smart Talk, a rural radio series exploring the world of progressive farming, including smarter application of nitrogen fertilizer, precision agriculture, emerging technologies, and equipment. You can find us here on Sirius, as well as online at www.smartnitrogen.com. Today's episode is focused on finding the sweet spot when it comes to nitrogen application, boosting yield, driving protein, increasing sustainability, managing ROI. It all starts with optimizing the N investment. Your host, Chris Forrest, is talking with experts across the country about optimizing nitrogen application. Too much, too little, just right. Optimizing your nitrogen. Andrea Jones is Research Associate in the Division of Plant Sciences, University of Missouri. Andrea has over 17 years of experience conducting research aimed at helping farmers grow profitable and sustainable crops. Joining us on the line from the Fisher Delta Research Center in Portageville, Missouri. Welcome to Smart Talk, Andrea. Thanks for having me, Chris. Can you tell us a little about the scope of research work that you and your team are doing down there at the Fisher Delta Research Center? Yes, sir. Actually, anything to do with cotton production is uh, what we do in the research. Uh, our most popular trials that we do for the producers is variety trials, but other than the variety trials, any new insecticide or herbicide that's coming out on the market, we have looked at those. We also do a lot of irrigation work and also fertilizer work. Pretty much uh, in the Missouri Boot Hill, there's four counties that produce cotton, and we are right here uh, in the heart of the Boot Hill, and so we serve all four of those counties. From economics to extreme weather conditions, farmers are facing uh, a lot of challenges. How does your research work help them? Well, I definitely have to say right now our biggest challenge is price. Uh, pretty much the price on all crops are down. Uh, the price of cotton was down, and therefore cotton production was down last year. But uh, now that all crop prices are down, cotton is still where they can make money. Uh, as long as the yield is in cotton, which it has been the last two years, we've set a record in cotton yield the last two years. That uh, when price is low on other crops, cotton is still where you can make money. So we're going to have an increase this year of about 20 percent. One of the biggest investments a crop farmer can make is, is in the nitrogen application. How is your research looking into ways that farmers can optimize their nitrogen for greater ROI? Uh, yes, uh, we're always looking at timing of nitrogen and the amount of nitrogen. Um, that all goes back to the environment. We have a very uh, shallow groundwater here and irrigation water is plentiful. Uh, because of that, sometimes we have a tendency maybe to over-irrigate. And, uh, of course, that, that would lead to runoff. When you have runoff, what happens? Your nutrients sometimes lead with that runoff. So it's very important that we are always working at making uh, nitrogen applications more efficient, especially with our, uh, especially with our excessive uh, irrigation here. What about some of the increasing environmental considerations that are going into nitrogen planting? Well, I just talked about runoff, and what runoff is, is uh, we uh, irrigate through furrows, and we lay polypipe, and it, uh, the water runs down each row. So when we put that granular fertilizer on the ground, uh, some of that leaves as we irrigate and goes out the tail ditches, and through the tail ditches, that goes out into our streams and eventually into the Mississippi River. And we've all heard about the hypoxic zone down in the Gulf. So therefore, that's why it's so important for us to keep doing uh, research on being more efficient with nitrogen, uh, with our nitrogen applications. How have you seen a product like ESN perform in Missouri in terms of incorporating it into an overall nitrogen plan? The Missouri recommendations for nitrogen have always been a split application. We put out about 60 pounds of nitrogen pre-plant, and then uh, square, we put out another 60 pounds. And so what the ESN does is that prevents that second application. So what we do is we put out ESN before we ever plant in the season, and instead of just laying that ESN on top of the ground, like we would normally do on a side dress application, we go ahead and work that ESN up so it's already underneath the soil, 
and you only have to make the pre-plant application. You don't have to come back and put a side dress application on where you leave that nitrogen on the ground. Andrea, in your 17-year career, you've seen an incredible amount of innovation and change in agriculture. What's really exciting you these days about the future in farming? Oh, I think what excites me the most is just the technology that has come down the line. I got in this industry, as a matter of fact, when I was in college and I was uh, scouting cotton, and that's what I did uh, during college to make money. And so back in 1995, farmers would ask me all the time, am I just going to make a bale of cotton? I need, I need to make one bale per acre to pay all of my bills. Well, that's uh, nowhere even close to what we make now. We're, we're having to make three and three and a half bales now. And so I think the technology, uh, the rising yields, and probably just being more efficient with insect management, herbicide management, um, has excited me most about this. Your work brings you into contact with a lot of young people who may be considering entering the industry. What do you tell them, Andrea, about the opportunities that lay ahead? Oh, there's so much opportunity in this field. It just depends on what direction you want to go. You know, the uh, kids that work for me, uh, many of them become salesmen. And, if, and, you know, if that's what excites you, then there is a lot of opportunity in sales. However, if research excites you, there's, there's a great opportunity in research only, not only at a university level, but also with companies. You know, all of these companies have researchers. It's not just the universities. Did you grow up on a farm yourself? I did not. My mother is an RN. She's a nurse. And my dad is a barber. I'm not from a far background at all. Well, that's really interesting. And without having that, that direct history or background with, with farming, I'm wondering, can you walk me through the, the, the college years? How did you possibly end up in soil science? Okay. Well, actually, I wanted to uh, be a horticulturalist. I wanted to have a landscape business. And in all reality, I, I figured I would always stay in this area. This is where my family's from. And uh, being in a rural community, I knew that people really wouldn't pay a lot of money for landscaping. And so just because I liked being outside, uh, I needed a job through college, and I started uh, scouting cotton in the summer. That's how it happened. And my first summer, I fell in love with it, and I knew this is what I wanted to do the rest of my life. So that first summer you spent working out in, in the fields and, and in the dirt, um, rather than that driving you towards an office job, it really decided it for you in terms of where you wanted to spend your career. Oh, yes, definitely. I like being outside. I can't imagine being in an office sitting all day. That's, that's just what I like doing. I like being in the field. Conducting the research and gathering the data is one part of your job. But how are you communicating effectively to farmers those results so that they can in turn apply it practically on their farm? Oh, yes, sir. Just last week we had our Missouri Cotton Conference here at the Delta Center. And then throughout the summer we will have field days. We have one uh, large field day, and it's uh, where the whole Delta Center puts on their plot tours. But again, throughout the summer, each department will also have their own tours, and I hold probably six or seven of those every year. So how many farmers would you typically get out to an event like that? Uh, usually when we have one event, we'll have 80 or 90 farmers at each. That's fantastic. That's terrific reach for getting your research results out there. How important is that for you and your work, that direct interaction with the farmer? I also like these field tours because they actually get out in the field and they can also give me ideas on what I should be doing different and things that I should be researching. I always said, uh, and what I do every day, it's to help producers. There's no sense in me doing research that's so far-fetched that a producer can't take it into their field and actually use it there. Absolutely. It's always got to be practical in order to be useful to the farmer in the field. We really appreciate you speaking with us today, Andrea, about the great work that you and your team are doing at the University of Missouri. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks again. We're talking today about the importance of optimizing the nitrogen investment. I have a short clip I'd like to play here where Alan Blaylock, agronomy manager with Agrium Wholesale, explains how ESN works. Well, ESN is a physically encapsulated nitrogen fertilizer. We put a semi-permeable coating on the outside of a conventional urea. That coating allows water to 
move into the urea, dissolves that urea fertilizer inside the coating, and then that coating regulates the delivery of that urea into the soil solution over a period of time. The rate of that process is controlled by the soil temperature. Now, what sets it apart in terms of the field of enhanced efficiency fertilizers compared to a stabilizer product or slow release? What really sets ESN apart? Well, all of the other enhanced efficiency fertilizers currently available in agriculture are chemical additives, something that's added to the fertilizer to change some of the chemical reactions and transformations that occur and attempting to stabilize that nitrogen or keep it in the soil longer by these chemical additives. ESN is a physical barrier. We restrict the exposure of the nitrogen to the environment using this coating, so it's not affected by many of the other processes that can affect the other chemical additives. We simply are controlling the amount of nitrogen that's available to the crop and therefore the amount that could potentially be lost at any point in time. John Niemeyer is an ESN marketing rep located out of Missouri, but his territory covers several states. His job is to help farmers incorporate ESN into their nutrient plan in order to maximize ROI. A farm boy himself, John understands firsthand the fine balance between spending money to make money. John and I had a chance to chat during a recent agricultural show. So, uh, what can you tell us about the uh, territory that you cover? Well, I cover Illinois, Iowa, Missouri, and northern Arkansas. So, I get around uh, a lot of corn acres, uh, a little bit of wheat acres, uh, soybeans, um, and then some specialty crops in different areas. Today, one of the things we're talking about is, the, is that panic in the spring to get out and, and apply your nitrogen and, and how ESN is something that really, um, you know, allows the, uh, the grower to kind of sit back and say, regardless of what's going on out in the field, I can trust that it's going to deliver the end when, uh, when I need it to. Well, we're seeing a lot of interest in it for 2016 based on a couple of different reasons. Number one is there are some areas that never got a lot of uh, fall ammonia on because of uh, some wet rains that had come through in some, some particular areas. It got cold uh, often late in the seasons, and uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of farmers were being good stewards and didn't uh, put their nitrogen on until it got cold. And so and the other thing uh, we've got is a price uh, gap. That's what we see sometimes with ESN compared to uh, anhydrous ammonia. It's, it's a lot closer. Uh, urea prices have, been, have gone down uh, quite a bit. We follow that urea pattern as we do. So when we look at their timing and what they're looking at for coming ahead in, in, in April or perhaps March, um, it, it's going to be a very tight time. And so ESN is very quick to put on. It isn't a gas. It's a dry product. You can blend it if you haven't put your dry on yet. Spread it, you know, um, you know, I've got guys doing it at 100 foot, some at 60, depending on what they're comfortable with and what they feel their spreaders can do. And then, uh, you know, they can travel pretty quick across the field and you can get 80 acres, uh, 300 acres done, done very quickly that way. Farmer was telling me uh, this morning from Illinois that he, uh, that he had uh, about 30 inches of um, rain in his field at one point and the ESN was really holding up. Yeah, and I, you know, to imagine what 30 inches is, is I had a college uh, friend of mine and showed me a yardstick and he said, you know, this is almost 30 inches and when you took a look at that and you think for it, it kind of puts things in perspective. It puts a lot of pressure. Where did that water go? It went off the field or it went down through it and nitrogen loves water so it's going to try and att attract to that and when that much water is leaving your farm, then, then sometimes some of that nitrogen will go along with it and so... Um, it, it does put a lot of pressure on keeping that nitrogen in there for your crop. You've been uh, talking with a lot of uh, uh, farmers passing through the, uh, the trade show today. What are some of the questions that you're getting? You know, how to, how to use it, what, uh, what's the best, best, best methods, uh, putting it on, where does it work best. Um, so, you know, what, we, what, what we'd like to do, and in, in, in some of the farmers have different methods of uh, how they farm. Some, oh, I've talked to some strip tillers. I've talk to some no-till guys, and then also so, some conventional guys. So we try and tailor ESN in for some of those um, crops and, and how they're farming and what, what is the best aspect and how they can use it so that, that they can get a return on a dollar. In some cases, we do very well, and it works very well. Some cases, maybe, maybe ESN's not the product, but 
But you know, it's always good to get uh, conversation and dialogue started with, with growers and uh, understand how they're, they're, they're looking at things and how they're trying to progress and move ahead and, and uh, find out where ESN can fit into that, that model. What about uh, storability and, uh, say, ESN compared to urea and some of the issues that, uh, that retailers face uh, accessing urea? Yeah, I, in fact, I had a farmer today, said, a large farmer, he said, if I put it in my shed, how long will it last? And I said, you know, I've seen it last a couple of years. And he said, oh, yeah, and he, and he kind of said, yeah, you know, and it can fly too. But uh, it, you don't see that. And I've never had a, had a farmer have a stomp this through a grate or a dealer um, because that polymer coating, it doesn't take on moisture, doesn't adhere together, and it flows very well. Um, you know, a guy told me in storing it in a shed, it's kind of like storing BBs sometimes because it, it flows so well in, in, in the usage of it. So I've never seen a problem with it caking up, and uh, I've worked with it for nine years. So, Excellent, John. Well, I hope you have a fantastic show. Well, thank you very much. Smart Talk, brought to you by ESN. Crops really go for ESN Smart Nitrogen, and so does your bottom line. That's because its unique technology responds to the same factors that spur plant growth. How does it do it? ESN is a urea granule encapsulated in a polymer coating that protects the nitrogen from loss through leaching, volatilization, and denitrification. ESN technology controls its release to match plant demand based on soil temperature. Your crops get the nitrogen they need when they need it. That's what we mean by responsive. Minimize your end loss. Maximize your yield. Visit SmartNitrogen.com and start optimizing. When it comes to providing farmers with cutting-edge advice they can trust, certified crop advisors are invaluable. Today on Smart Talk, we welcome Eric Welsh and Andy Knepp to talk about the role of certified crop advisors. Eric Welsh is the Program Manager for Marketing and Business Relations at the American Society of Agronomy, which administers the prestigious Certified Crop Advisor Program. Andy Knepp has been a certified crop advisor since 2001 and currently is serving as the chair of the International CCA Board of Directors. Welcome to Smart Talk, gentlemen. Thank you. Eric, can you tell us about the American Society of Agronomy and its certified crop advisor program? Well, the American Society of Agronomy has been around for a long time, uh, primarily a membership uh, organization that uh, cultivate, cultivates future uh, agricultural sciences, Oh, scientists, excuse me, and uh, just basically uh, perpetuates any type of uh, academic research, um, application of uh, what's discovered through that research, uh, just for the advancement of uh, agriculture as a whole. And uh, as a part of that, they certify the agronomists out in the field. Um, and that's a certified crop advisor program. And there's a, a few components to becoming certified uh, to prove that you have that you're giving that quality advice to the grower. Um, so you go through a testing process uh, where you you test through the international exam and the local board exam, just so that you have the base knowledge around uh, uh, crop management, integrated pest management, soil and water management. Um, all those different components, and that that comes together. Uh, after your examination, you're ready to apply, and uh, as a part of the application, you have to have uh, uh, references from growers and references from uh, employers proving that you have the experience. If you have a two-year component uh, or two years experience that you're applying with, you also have to have an education component as a part of it, so uh, a bachelor's degree in a related field. If you don't have uh, the, the background uh, or the bachelor's degree, uh, you can use four years of experience to come in and uh, put that towards your uh, your certification. Uh, so it's a pretty lengthy process. You have you, you have proven application uh, as well as the knowledge base to get started, and it, it uh, really shows how how a uh, dedicated agronomist goes that extra mile to become a certified crop advisor. So they're helping as a uh, business partner to uh, to growers. Thanks, Eric. Andy, you've been a certified crop advisor since 2001, and you're currently serving as chair of the International Board of Directors. How has getting involved inside the organization changed your view of the importance of the role of a certified crop advisor? Well, I think it certainly really highlights the notion that um, there's a lot of information out there in the marketplace. There's uh, potentially a lot of misinformation out there in the marketplace. And 
you know, you, you really have to trust the individual that's providing you advice. If you were a farmer on, on crop inputs, on, you know, management practices in it. And the thing that the, the CCA program does so well is part of that certification and maintaining the certification is making sure that every CCA completes at least 40 hours of continuing education every two years. And, and that's what really helps keep the CCAs and it helps you if you're a farmer working with the CCA helps you understand that they're keeping up with, with how agriculture changes. And if I just look back over, you know, my brief career and, and I say brief career, because when you look at the big picture, um, it's, it's been a short time, but the amount of change and the acceleration and the rate of change is, is incredible. And, and really, if we want to make sure that we're working with people that have the ability to give us the best advice, the most um, timely advice, the, the most relevant advice, it's got to be up to date. And the only way to do that is to really make sure there's a mechanism uh, around their continuing education. And that's one of the things that CCA really provides. In terms of providing farmers with with advice they can trust, based on all the changes that are happening with tools and technology, Eric, how does the CCA go about educating its members? Well, the biggest way we can provide that value um, to uh, to the farmer ultimately is uh, providing quality uh, continuing education. As a part of those 40 hours, uh, we supplement those 40 hours by providing um, uh, webinars, online education. We have an on-demand library, but our best attended uh, events are live webinars that uh, we pair with uh, um, industry sponsors, government agencies to provide that education that is required in the marketplace, um, really depending on the, the topic that is, um, that is relevant, uh, up-to-date, any technological advances, um, any regulatory advances. Um, that we need to be aware of and that ultimately uh, a CCA needs to keep in mind when working with a grower. Um, so we're, that's our primary way to provide that, uh, besides our local boards providing winter meetings to keep advancing that, uh, that local education. In terms of education, there's an increasing awareness around environmental issues. What can you tell me about the role of 4R nutrient stewardship in CCA programming and education? So I'll, I'll take a stab at that. Yeah. yeah. So- if you think about, um, you know, just some of the challenges that, that, uh, that farmers face, um, but, but really I think we all face, whether we're in the industry or whether we're just, uh, you just think about the average consumer. I mean, there's lots of uh, concern around nutrient loss, uh, especially for, for those of us in the, uh, in the Mississippi River Basin, and lots of, uh, lots of concern around how does that impact the regulatory framework that growers have to work under. Our perspective is, and perspective has always been, uh, that if we can um, provide certified, trained, intelligent professionals to help with recommendations on the farm, and, and that's that's really truly the basis of the CCA program, um, we can actually make sure that, that we have people out there making good recommendations, and part of good recommendations are, you know, how do we protect the environment? As a, as a way to really kind of step that up and, and one of the things that as we evolve as a program uh, that we look at is what other areas do we need to be thinking about? Uh, where do we need increased focus, uh, increased scrutiny? And what opportunities can we um, take advantage of out there, again, to help not only just our farmer customers, but to, uh, to again, think about how do we show up in front of the general public uh, as an industry? couple things that we've done here in, in, the, in the recent year or two um, is to create a, a four-hour four hour specialty. So again, if we think about the, the four hours of nutrient management, right, source, rate, time, um, and, and we think about how do we make sure that all personnel that are out there making recommendations to farmers are using those, it's, it's a way for an individual CCA who you know, already should be making those types of recommendations to, to further specialize and to further demonstrate uh, a higher level of um, of, of ability in that area. So that's, that's a new um, specialty certification that we're adding. So it's, it, it requires somebody to, to be already be a certified crop advisor. Um, and then it allows them to, uh, to again, demonstrate a, a higher level of, of knowledge and abilities in that area. Another one that we've uh, recently uh, adopted and, and what we'll be offering here soon uh, is around uh, sustainability. So as we hear more about sustainability, we see more of uh, 
corporate America adopting sustainability uh, pledges. We see more folks uh, in the um, retail marketplace looking to offer sustainably produced products. Um, it's an opportunity. It's it's an area where you know really out here in in the field um, there maybe isn't a lot of expertise. And if we can provide uh, programming certification, uh, it's an it's an opportunity for farmers to potentially capture value. Uh, it's an opportunity for CCAs to to help guide them through that process uh, as some of these programs open up. Um, a third one uh, that we're also working on is is around pest management. And as we look at challenges and issues with uh, pests developing resistance to some of our uh, production techniques. Um, again, trying to, to make sure that we offer some programming and, and a certification for folks that can specialize in managing uh, those populations should they exist uh, or uh, helping to delay or prevent uh, the, the, uh, the onset of that sort of, uh, of uh, population. Your involvement at the international level, is that providing you with, with some new insights into how this conversation about global sustainability and, and food production is taking place? Yeah, I mean, it, I think it certainly has created an opportunity for me. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a, an Illinois native. I, I work with growers in Illinois and Wisconsin. We're, we're largely focused on commodity crop production, and I think sometimes the average commodity crop, crop producer says, hey, I don't know about these sustainability programs, but I don't really see how they apply to me. And, and in fact, it's really just the opposite, um, that, that we do uh, work in a, in a global supply chain and people are looking at what are those production practices in commodity crops and, and how do we make sure that, that uh, we're, we're making those more sustainable. So it's, it's been a unique opportunity for, for us to get involved. Um, and obviously the CCA program is not just about row crops. That just happens to be my background. Um, but it certainly opened my eyes. And, and again, you know, back to an earlier question, I mean, some of the, some of the relationships that, that we have in the industry, whether it uh, be with, uh, with, you know, some of the, uh, uh, either USDA, NRCS, or, um, you know, we, we have relationships with the EPA office of water. They, they actually have a membership that, that sits on our board, uh, in both cases. Um, we partnered with field to market, uh, around sustainability practices. We're partnered up. Um, with uh, with a lot of other groups in that regard, and, and so it's it's nice because it's it's kind of a uh, highlighting how interconnected everything is. Well, that makes a lot of sense, Eric. How would I go about finding a certified crop advisor? Well, most of the time they're they're working at that local retail outlet, or they're that or they're that local seed dealer, uh, fertilizer distributor. Um, but if you'd want to go on a more uh, uh, national level without the, the word of mouth piece, you'd want to go to our website, certifiedcropadvisor.org. And on there, you can uh, hover over uh, uh, about the certification and uh, check out our database, um, which you can search uh, by location, by specialty, uh, find a CCA uh, slash CPAG, and that'll take you right to the database there. Eric Welsh, Andy Knapp, thanks for joining us today, gentlemen, to talk about the role of certified crop advisors in helping farmers grow more successfully. Thank you for your time. Yep, thanks for the opportunity. Smart Talk, brought to you by ESN. When it comes to protecting your valuable nitrogen investment, smart growers trust ESN Smart Nitrogen. ESN works when the plant needs it most. The urea granule is encapsulated in a unique polymer coating that protects the nitrogen from being lost to ground, air, and water. Your crops get the nitrogen they need when they need it. Now that's responsive nitrogen. Minimize your end loss. Maximize your yield. Visit smartnitrogen.com and start optimizing. Welcome to ESN Smart Talk a rural radio series exploring the world of progressive farming, including smarter application of nitrogen fertilizer, precision agriculture, emerging technologies, and equipment. You can find us here on Sirius, as well as online at www.smartnitrogen.com. Welcome to part two, a smart investment, optimizing your nitrogen. Today we're talking about the importance of optimizing your nitrogen investment. Kelly DuPont is an ESN marketing rep who covers much of the southern United States across all different crops and weather and soil conditions. Welcome to Smart Talk, Kelly. Yes, sir. Nice to be here. So how long have you been working with ESN? 
I'm going into my fourth growing season with ESN. That's great, Kelly. I understand you cover a, a very large territory with lots of different soil and weather conditions. Uh, well, I cover Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, uh, Arkansas, south of I-40, uh, East Texas, which includes, uh, I guess, South Texas, and then Florida. So again, really wide range uh, of soil conditions, weather conditions to work with your growers. What can you tell us about what you've seen across that territory in terms of extremes in the past couple of years? Oh, it's, it's gone from super wet to super dry, and uh, it just about happened overnight. Uh, every year has been a good bit different, though. And uh, it's, it's given our ESN an opportunity to, to do what we say it's going to do. That's fantastic, Kelly. Being able to see ESN perform under all of those various conditions that farmers are facing. You work with a lot of the university research centers, and how important is it to conduct plot tours with farmers to actually show in the field with various crops the results with ESN? Yeah, I mean, that, these guys, they like to see it on uh, local crops for sure, but you know what really gets them going is to see it on their own land. And uh, I think probably the most effective way is to get those guys to split a field, uh, you know, do some do some sections across a field, across uh, you know different soil types, and then they can they can see for themselves what he is and can do on their own farm. When we talk about optimizing the nitrogen investment, that can also mean saving on fuel and and labor with one pass application. How does ESN work there, Kelly? Uh, well, I, I think that what ESN does what, what all of the researchers and you know everyone it, it tells them they need to do, which is spoon feed the crop. That's why they tell them to, to do all these split applications and you know put a little bit out at planting and side dress and then you know even later in the season if they need it. So upwards of three trips in the field. Uh, with ESN, they're able to put it out one time and walk away from it and focus on you know different different aspects of their operation. So that's a that's a big key for them, just to be able to get across those acres a lot faster, and just know that that nitrogen investment is protected. Um, you know, the the other is just the speed of application, especially when you compare it to like a liquid uh, application, where it's just really slow. Um, it's you know potentially uh, wet. And, you know, they may not even be able to make it out through the field to do some of those applications. And, um, you know, ESN gives them a, a good window of opportunity to do that uh, since you can, you don't necessarily have to be exactly on time with your application because you can, you can put it out early and, uh, and get out of there and do it when, when it's convenient for you. Providing farmers with credible third-party data and proof from the field is incredibly important. What's exciting you these days, Kelly, about new research? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess probably the the two biggies that I'm really uh, excited about that we're seeing really good results in is uh, ryegrass. Uh, you know, fall, fall uh, ryegrass is, um, ESN is just picture perfect made for that. Uh, since it's temperature based, uh, they're able to put that ESN out there. And uh, if once it starts raining and then turns really cold, then the ryegrass really isn't growing. Uh, but, you know, every other nitrogen source is subject to loss. Uh, ESN is just sitting out in the, in the field, cold, uh, protected, and waiting on sunshine, waiting on, uh, on better growing conditions. And as soon as that sun pops and the, the ryegrass uh, seems like it needs to grow, then uh, the ESN is there and, uh, and waiting. And, uh, and then same thing, it turns off cold, starts raining again. Only what has released from the prill of ESN is uh, subject to loss. Everything else is, is protected and, and just waiting on better growing conditions. Uh, the other crop, I guess, would be uh, sugarcane in South Louisiana. We're seeing some really good results in sugarcane. Uh, they're generally on uh, either heavy, heavy, you know, heavy clay soils that are subject to denitrification problems or uh, even sandy dirt that you know, is subject to really heavy leaching. And... Uh, most of these guys only apply fertilizer one time during the season, and it's a you know it's a year long, you know ten eleven month crop. So uh, you know ESN really gives those guys an opportunity to have that that nitrogen out there for a longer period of time and protected and and really give that crop a, a better a better chance to to reach its potential. What's your background? Did you grow up on a farm? I would say I grew up on a small farm. Uh, you know, probably more like a huge garden, I guess you'd call it. 
Uh, but I did, you know, spend a lot of time in, you know, in the fields and, uh, you know, whether it be tomatoes and corn and watermelons and, you know, whatever. Um, so I, I was always the one that was out there with my grandfather and, and uh, doing those kinds of things as a kid, yes. So much has changed since those days you walked through the fields with your grandfather, Kelly. It must give you a lot of pride to know that today you're helping farmers grow smarter, more profitable, sustainable crops. Uh, to me, it's exciting to to have a product that actually does what it says it's going to do, and um, it it resonates with these farmers, and uh, they they realize that they can do a better job on their their farm. Yeah, it must feel good to know you're playing a role in introducing innovative tools that are helping farmers grow smarter. Kelly, how important is it to to walk out into those fields with your farmer customer post application to see how those granules are working? Yeah, and it, it is nice to uh, to be able to to take a farmer out into his field, uh, you know, a month after uh, his nitrogen's been applied, and uh, and go dig around and look and and show him that uh, not only does he have nitrogen left, but he can get a really good feel on how much nitrogen he has left, and because uh, he can physically go out and find it and see it with his eyes and uh, and know that he can sleep well knowing he still has nitrogen in his field and it's protected. I guess it really does resonate with these guys. I had a farmer, I guess not last season, must have been 2014 mm-hmm. uh, in the Mississippi Delta that did, uh, I guess, about 400 acres of grain sorghum. And, uh, you know, he put it all out at planting. And I guess probably a month into it, you know, it was all, you know, knee higher better. And it rained and rained and rained. I think they got up close to 20 inches of rain. Well, all of his crop went underwater, the whole 400 acres. And, uh, and it, it, he lost it. It had been underwater for, I guess, a couple of weeks or longer, you know, 10 feet underwater. And so as the water was coming off the field, he, uh, you know, started kind of trying to plan, see if there was something that he could put on and, you know, and plant for a, you know, a late season crop and was asking me, is there any nitrogen left? And I told him, well, I think there probably will be. Let's go look. And, uh, you know, we went out there and must have dug up 50 spots. And you could see with your eyes that probably it looked to me like 75%, three out of four prills were still there. Wow. After being underwater for two weeks. And he thought that was fascinating. That's and incredible. And any other source would have been completely, yeah. Gone. So that you know, it really, really you know, tells a story on ESN that, uh, you know, it is protected. It's not just going to go into solution and run into a ditch somewhere. That's a really powerful story, Kelly. Always enjoy talking with you, and thanks for joining us on Smart Talk. Okay, yes, sir. No, I enjoyed it. Anytime. All right. Thanks, Kelly. Bye. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. When it comes to providing crop farmers with the right products, services, and tools they need to grow successfully, there's no more important relationship than the local retailer. Bill Bailey, CPS retailer in Grenada, Mississippi, joins us on the line. Welcome to Smart Talk, Bill. Thank you a lot, Chris. Pleasure to be here. We know spring is a busy time for retailers like you, Bill, helping farmers set their seeding and nutrient plans. How are things looking this spring? Presently, we are booking a lot of seed for the coming year. It seems in my area that more acres are going to be going into cotton and corn production than we've seen in the past. Our soybean numbers have have dropped down a good bit, and I believe that the acreage is down simply from an economic standpoint because of the fact that soybeans, the commodity prices are down so low. Uh, Corn and cotton aren't really that much better uh, from a perspective, but in the hills of Mississippi, uh, irrigation is not very prevalent as it is in the delta of Mississippi. And so it seems like cotton and corn, especially cotton, seems to be uh, a better option for our area. You touched on the issue of lean commodity pricing, Bill. How does that come into play when you're sitting across the table from a farmer and working out a plan for inputs? Well, we definitely need to utilize uh, every tool we have in the toolbox um, with the way prices are shaping up for this year. And also, um, with nitrogen, you need to make sure that you're getting the bang for your buck. Uh, You definitely don't want to put something out there and, and lose a lot of the product and that's an issue that we have in our area because during the spring and summer it is so hot and so humid in our area that we do are well we are faced a lot of times with volatility of nitrogen you know losing the nitrogen that you put out there and 
the money that you spent is just thrown out the window. And so that's something that we keep a close eye on, especially on a year like this year where we need our yields to be up there and we need our inputs to be as low as possible. And so with a product like ESN that, that provides a controlled release of, of that nitrogen to the growing plants, how do, you, how do you help farmers incorporate that into their plan? Well, it's been uh, a very good asset uh, ESN has in our area strictly because I, t- I spoke of before the volatility because um, you put you say you put urea out there and you know you don't have the protection of the ESN or um, or just say Agritain for instance but specifically ESN you lose a lot of product um, very quickly in the in the conditions that we have during the growing season and so by the way the ESN is releasing the nitrogen kind of spoon feeding the crop it's a perfect fit for our area uh, from an uh, environmental standpoint because of the conditions we do face. And I know that uh, plot tours and field tours are, are an important way of, of bringing farmers out to see results in the field and, and some of the proof. What, what are some of the other ways that you're helping to introduce new tools and, and ideas to farmers? Well, we certainly, um, I try to get my farmers together, whether it's in a group of three or five or, or even as many as 10. And like we go out to lunch together and things and I talk about products that that are on the horizon or, or things that are going to be available this year that maybe they didn't have last year and show them how they can be beneficial to them um, and also make them money because if I'm introducing something new and it's not going to put more money in their pocket, they're they don't really show much interest in it, and I can't blame them. Absolutely, Bill. It all comes back to ROI. How are you and your team staying up on all of the new technologies and tools that are coming out to help farmers maximize their return on investment? Well, a lot of times we have meetings with our uh, Agrium's technical people um, on new products, and also just by our sales meetings, um, we find out what's new on the market and then we're the ones really the liaison with the farmer because it's, that's our job to convey the new product or the uh, the new idea to our farmer because without them you know we're the uh we're the key to reaching the farmer uh and so if if we don't get it out to the farmer there's really without any type of just kind of like advertising or anything like that the farmer's not going to know about it if there's not some um, advertisement or just because word of mouth is, is a lot of ways that farmers find out about things. And if I tell one farmer about something before I know it, eight or ten of them will know about it, and three or four will already have called me if I just tell one about a, a new product or a new idea out there. So um, word of mouth does help to spread uh, information about new products. But it's my job uh, to convey it. Uh, to, the, to our customers, to Agrium's customers. And how long have you been doing what you're doing, Bill? I have been in the ag business for 28 years. This will be my 29th growing season. Wow, 29 years. So in that time, w- would it be fair to say we're reading a lot of information increasingly about extremes of weather? Is that something you've seen you know, over the past 30 years come and go, or do you definitely see a marked increase in extremes? Well, I think that the past couple of years uh, have been extremely good growing conditions for farmers. We've had, uh, last year our yields weren't just over the top, but we had good solid average yields on our main three crops, which are cotton, corn, and soybeans. Uh, The previous two years before last year, our yields were exceptional. The weather was perfect. We got ideal rainfall. Um, I would say that the extremes... I think it's really been cyclical. I don't see a real pattern. I know last year we got into a small uh, drought period, and that that hurt our yield, and it wasn't like it had been the previous two years. But still, we just had had an excellent crop, but the thing that hurt us more than anything was commodity prices. And so uh, environmentally, I'll say that – I think it's kind of been on in a cyclical pattern, like I say. It hadn't been one extreme for a real long time uh, from my viewpoint. 
You've seen an incredible amount of, of change in agriculture across your nearly 30-year career, Bill. What do you see as the opportunity for young people entering this dynamic industry today? Well, uh, the, the young people today are so technologically savvy, it's unbelievable. I mean, they can jump in a, a tractor and pick up right away on all the new computer things that are available in tractors or where it's a fertilizer spreader. I mean, everything is changing so fast. It's, it's, it's amazing whether it's uh, in the variable rate planning or variable rate technology on fertilizer, and they are able to grasp the information so quick because they're used to dealing with computers where some of our older guys um, either resist the change or aren't as quick to pick it up, I would say. But I will tell any young people that are getting into farming or thinking about getting into farming that it's um, it's a very high risk, of course, but very high reward. If um, I mean, if you can make a good crop and and uh, commodity prices improve, you can make a very good living in ag- agriculture. But it takes a lot of hard work and a lot of long hours. It certainly also takes a team of trusted advisors, and I know you take a lot of pride, Bill, in helping farmers in your area grow more successfully. Really appreciate you taking time to talk with us today on Smart Talk. Okay, Chris. Thank you a lot, bud. I'll see you. To join the conversation, find us on Twitter with the handle at Smart Nitrogen or hop online at www.smartnitrogen.com. Thanks for joining us on ESN Smart Talk, a rural radio series exploring innovation and opportunities in farming. Join us again at the same time and place, September 13th, as we continue the conversation.